Yeah, this is Sushovan from IIT Madras. Yes. Yeah, sir, we all thank you to accept the invitation of giving a video lecture. Uh, well, it's my my pleasure. Okay, sir, we, we can start the talk. Uh, okay, okay, that's fine. I will be happy to start. So, uh, I just want to say, uh, to begin with, it, it's a very odd experience to uh, uh, to give a talk, uh, but not be standing up in in front of you. Uh, and I, I just uh, can imagine uh, that it was probably uh, 80 degrees and very hot in uh, in Chennai today. And it's the end of your day, so um, it's probably the cool of the evening. Whereas here in Boston, uh, it's been below freezing now for about, uh, several months, and uh, uh, it's it's um, it's so different. Anyway, so it's uh, anyway it, it's so it's amazing to me, especially this great software that your um, IIT department has put together, so that I can do this. So uh, what I wanted to talk about today was um, to give some sense of the, um, the field of computer vision uh, because it combines uh, challenges from engineering uh, with interesting mathematical uh, questions and uh, mathematical and statistical and computational questions. So uh, I found it to be a very uh, fruitful field to study. So uh, I, I'd like to start with uh, uh, <clears throat> so uh, so basically the the challenge is that you have a, a an image of the real world. Uh, so it uh, it could be a video or a still picture, uh, but you need to recognize the objects, the three dimensional structure. Um, uh, for instance, a friend of mine, a student of mine, uh, started a company to um, simply to give a handheld device for blind people that they could point around them, and whatever uh, words were there uh, in whatever alphabet, uh, it would read them, read uh, <coughs> read these words to the blind person, so they could see street signs, uh, names of stores, and so on. That turned out to be an incredibly difficult challenge, still uh, not uh, solved. Um, but the uh, the real goal is that we need to uh, we would ideally like to have a general purpose vision system that can roughly duplicate human uh, abilities given a, a random scene uh, to be able to uh, to analyze that scene and describe it. Um, so, as I say, mathematics and statistics have been uh, are, are being very heavily used uh, in in the pursuit of such a system. Um, now, one of the things that in inspired me, there's a beautiful book by uh, uh, David Marr called Vision, in, in which he basically formulated uh, the, uh, the problem of, of seeing things uh, as being an abstract problem solved by animals and hopefully, in now and in the future, solved by computers. Uh, but that underlying both solutions, there should be a certain theory of what you need to compute. So there was a, an abstract uh, theory underlying um, both the uh, uh, psychological, neurophysiological uh, solution that is implemented in us uh, and what we seek to do in a computer. Um, so he, he made all sorts of analogies at that time. Um, now, uh, <clears throat> why is this problem hard? What you see, I, I think the easiest way to explain it is you have to put yourself in the position of the computer. Uh, so, okay. So <clears throat> here you have a, um, he was a graduate student at the time, uh, and we've drawn a, a circle around his, his face there on the right. Uh, and there on the left is uh, the picture, his picture, but now it's it's made into a graph, so that the white areas of his skin are high, and the the black areas, for instance, the ball, the eyeballs, uh, the eye is the pupils are low, 
um, and um, so you can you can see look at that as a weird sort of mask and say all right that's obviously uh, given that uh, that's obviously a person uh, but now uh, let's compare it now here's a scene with pebbles uh, and you can see you get a random set of, of sort of mountains and valleys that looks kind of like pebbles but okay now what is this a picture of is that pebbles or is that a face so it certainly doesn't look uh, anything like a face uh, so uh, so the question is what is being depicted in that all right so that's that's the challenge we have uh, on the top the, the the clearly a face the middle is pebbles the bottom what is it um, all right <laughs> it's the same face but now uh, with a very strong shadow effect on the face so you see how uh, now for a human being it's obvious uh, let's see can you see the arrow is that appearing on the screen no it's not appearing oh yes it is right okay you can see uh, to, for a human being this person and, and this person uh, look extremely similar and you immediately discount the lighting uh, and you see that, the, that uh, you have a person in both cases but how is a computer possibly going to see this and this as being um, two images of the same person uh, you can see why this is a very difficult problem uh, okay well now here is here I am on the left and a, a former graduate student of mine, Catherine Leonard, on the right. Uh, and we have both of these images here converted to black and white and shown in um, uh, as uh, uh, with the dark areas uh, suppressed down and the light areas up. So the question is, which is which? So uh, I asked the audience, um, uh, for for an opinion so raise your hand so let's say so am I on the top or the bottom so if you think I'm on the top raise your hands uh, you think I'm on the bottom no one's raising their hands ah yeah you're all you're right the grizzled face here uh, whereas the the, um, um, the smooth skin and so on and the dark features uh, of my student are, ex are extremely come out very clearly whereas uh, I'm so sort of gray and uh, and not so clear okay you, you all got that one right now here's a puzzle what is this a picture of uh, so I, I, I give you uh, uh, a, f a few seconds and anyone who, who thinks they know what it's a picture of uh, raise their hand any any people any guesses no I, I don't see any hands raised come on no no wild guess uh, okay in, in front uh, Santos is that you yeah um, what? is it a watch a watch is it a watch? What? that's uh, well that's interesting no it's not actually <laughs> it's Saturn, <laughs> uh, but so you see, you can see when you see a picture, there is so much going on in your head by which you 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 process this image. How from that peculiar, I mean, the thing on the left is really the image is the signal that's going from your retina to your brain. That's the signal, for heaven's sake, and uh, and yet your brain immediately says Saturn uh, when you see that. Um, I don't know. Maybe it would have helped a little bit if I rotated it a bit, but I, I don't know. Not too much. Um, my point is that what's going on in your head is, is complex and needs to be understood. Now, here's another twist. What um, does anyone have a, uh, a guess? What that's a picture of? I think my audience is very shy. No one is making wild guesses. Uh, all right. Uh, it's very odd. I mean, what, are they, what is this peculiar sort of ring shape thing with these blobs and then this dark thing? Well, <laughs> it's a close up of this man's face. So it, it's an old man with a wrinkled coat sitting on a bench uh, with a, 
a floppy hat on. Now, how in heaven's name uh, is a computer going to work out? I mean, you know, immediately you know what that uh, that picture is, but it's um, well now. So here's here's one uh, particular clue. I mean, one of the first things which is actually very hard for the computer is to is to see this down here uh, as a continuous curve. You see, because here it's light against dark. Um, here it's dark against light. The 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 contrast changes. In some places, the contrast is very low in here. Um, and yet, in, in our heads, we connect to all that uh, as being a boundary. Um, and another big clue is that this line connects to this line here. That's what I call C in, in, over here in red. Uh, and so you, you connect these and assume that there's a, some, an object in front of the bench uh, here, and that brings this figure out into the foreground. Uh, and then when you see this, the outline of him, uh, so finally the face, which is to totally obscured here, and, uh, begins to, and then the totally misleading, in an utterly misleading way, his hand is in front of his face there. So, but not, somehow or other we're able to, to figure it out, even though, but you can see why this is a tremendous puzzle. What's going on in our heads when we do this? OK, well, here's the 3D effect. Uh, you see, here's a simple picture of leaves. And if you just take light, dark regions, you have uh, nine of them here. But if you, uh, if you put them into different layers, uh, using the idea that this line and this line should be connected, um, you begin to separate out the different um, leaves, and it becomes simpler. Uh, so this is one element. Is is for this is perhaps the royal road for getting 3D. Uh, is occlusion, finding what's in front of what. Um, and here's a here's a famous um, puzzle of Kanitsa. Uh, for most people looking at this, at first glance, it looks as if the man and the woman are intertwined in the fence, uh, being in front of the fence here and behind the fence here and the woman's skirt being in front of the fence here, and her blouse being behind the fence here. And actually, that's simply for the following reason, that here, um, well, uh, this, uh, the dark area is clearly uh, put behind the fence. Here, the lighting is the same, uh, and it's much easier to complete this contour than to complete that contour, which is, has a much longer gap in it. So there's all kinds of small clues that you can try to quantify and, and use here, and people have done that. But I, I'll give you an, an this is another challenge. And in, 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 if you're trying to figure out what is going on in your head, one very nice way to do it uh, is to try to guess the content of a blurry picture uh, and try to see what clues you finally uh, use to figure out the content of a picture. So I'm going to show you this picture in higher and higher resolution. I'm starting here with, with simply 10 pixels high, 15 pixels across. And the pixels look like this. Now, the pixels themselves are irritating, so it's best to blur them out a little bit. At this resolution, this is essentially what you see. And I don't think anyone ha would have a clue what this is a picture of. So I'm going to make it a little clearer now. and. Um, at this point, um, some people are actually able to guess what this is a picture of. Um, so if anyone has a guess, I'm trying to loosen you guys up so you actually make some uh, risk making a guess. All right. Well, for one thing, by the way, you can kind of see that there's something like ground. You would assume this is a ground. And this is some sort of object. And it's sort of logical to think that these things are somehow connected to each other. So you kind of think there's a thing standing on a thing on the ground somehow. And that's correct, actually. But there's all this other stuff in the background which confuses you. All right. Well, now I'm going to make it clear. And if you can't guess it now, now, come on. You've got 60 pixels across and 40 up. Um,
whoever whoever has a guess, you have to unfortunately speak loud because I really can't hear you very well. Penguin. Penguin. Ah, yeah, a penguin. Exactly. Excellent. Excellent. Yes, that's exactly what it is. There we go. Um, now, the question is, how in heaven's name did you recognize a penguin? Well, the computer has a lot of trouble uh, because there's the ice in the background really uh, looks like it ought to be something, but it's sort of irrelevant to everything. Uh, so I guess basically you have to know the shape of it. You, you have a very faint contour here. That's, that's what, if you saw that contour, you would immediately realize it was a penguin. Uh, this is faint, but, but it's highly significant. So it's, you've got to get that contour, and then immediately your, um, your models of, of a penguin are going to click in. Well, um, so here's <coughs> this. This was used uh, in Berkeley. Jitendra Malik had a contest. He had well, not a really contest. He had many students come in and label what they thought were the significant contours in this image. And of course, they all knew that it was. They saw it as a penguin, and they knew this was a very important contour. Some of the students labeled this. That's why it's faint. But not, but not many. The ones which every student labeled are. are Strong. Now, notice his feet are actually pretty obscure here. They're really, they blend in with a rock. Uh, but nonetheless, the students, of course, knew they were important. Now, this was a state-of-the-art computer. This is a false color image in which the computer segmented the image uh, into different regions, which seemed to be um, part of the same object. And it basically got the penguin, although it got a bit confused in here. Uh, and it certainly didn't put these together, which it should have, um, and it messed up the feet. So it, it's pretty close. Okay, now here's another challenge. I, I, I'm going to go through three of these because they're just sort of fun because they each illustrate. Now, oh, I shouldn't have gone to. Now, at this point, uh, I want you, you probably all realize that this area uh, is the ground, and it's very logical to assume that this is a road because of the color, the gray color, and the, and the shape of it, and then this is a horizon. So OK, we're using certain ideas about the structure of the world and using that to label the picture. Now we get this one. Now the question is, how about, how about now? So now I, wa I want some guesses uh, what we're looking at. Some people are very good at this. What's this thing up, up, oh, no, up here? I, can you, uh, Santos? Can you repeat what was that? Because I can't hear clearly. Cycle, cycle, what? bicycle. Yeah, very good. It's exactly it's a bicycle. Exactly. Now, what? How did you know it was a bicycle? That is really quite startling. Uh, I mean, the angle, I guess. Uh, the the ratio of the height. I mean, it doesn't look like a person standing exactly. But yeah, it's it's a bicycle. How about this down here? Shadow. Yeah, well, the point is part of it is in shadow. That's the misleading part. This and this are actually part of the same object, but you'd never know it. OK, now you can guess it. Now the bicycle is really clear. Now you ought to be able to guess what this is. Well, it's a little tricky. <laughs> it's an alligator, and it's my daughter-in-law on the bicycle. <laughs> so okay, let's see. What do we have? How, what what what's the kind of logic going on? Okay, there's the sky. It's light and above the rest. The road has a shape. It has a perspective, tapering, and a color. The bicyclist. You have the figure, the the, the angle, the proportions. The alligator. The, the lighting. It's like the person. Lighting really is is gigantic challenge. Um, once, it, once it becomes clear, you begin to see the texture. But uh, you don't really see the texture in, uh, over here. Um, uh, OK. Uh, all right. Now I'll give you, I'm going to give you, um, uh, I'm going to give you some Indian context. Um, uh, and it, <laughs> you, you might actually guess it from here. Uh, Motorcycle? No. Uh, uh, how about these? Bulls. Bulls. 
Yeah, yeah, what? I hear? Bull. Say, say it loud. What? Bull, bull. Yeah, yeah. Right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, now, um, now it's completely clear, right? Bike. Motorcycle. A bike? Wait a minute, wait a minute. C come on, you see these things, right? Two. Two bullet. Yeah, a bullet cart, a bullet cart, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> okay, now what's going on here? There's several things which are, uh, which are interesting. Uh, so first of all, with the horns, uh, their, their distinctive color, uh, of course, painted for a festival, uh, the symmetry of them uh, is, is very striking. We're very good at recognizing symmetry. So these are sort of mirror image objects. So you, you, you cluster these. Uh, then we have an occlusion phenomenon going on here. Uh, so this dark bar, the, the, um, the yoke there, um, uh, but but yet the other point is that once you have the horns, uh, then you, uh, the, it, what kicks in is 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 that you have a model of of, of what the, there should be a head here. Uh, so so the seeing the horns uh, leads you to the rest of the head, right? So uh, so the eye, is, which is there, uh, the nose. Uh, it's maybe it takes a bit of guessing here, but but. You, but you see, uh, once you have the idea that this is a head, uh, the rest you can really make out pretty clearly in that in that image. Um, and of course, the the yoke has the occlusion effect uh, going on, um, uh, which brings this forward also, and the, and the background here of the rest of the the hump on the bullock and, and the background. Okay, I'll give you one last one just for the, for the heck of it. That's pretty unclear, but now, um, <clears throat> now how about here? There's this this stuff here, you might be able to guess. A lady. Do I hear something? Can you repeat? A lady. Did I hear something? Making a guess? Lady. Lady. A lady. Well, there actually is a lady in this picture, but I'm not sure you see her yet. Uh, let me point out that here's a, this should be a clue. These, this kind of object, uh, there's certain r hints of rectangular structure back here. Um, and here you, see, you can see that there's, there's many set of objects that sort of repeat themselves. Okay, okay. I won't... Now you see it immediately, right? <laughs> uh, I'm not sure. Was it some sort of squash? Is it? Or oh, it's coconuts. It says here. I guess these are coconuts. Uh, but the point is, uh, a huge clue. Uh, you see, there are these rectangular. There are rectangular objects get more and more clearer as you progress here, um, and that's a clue that it's a man-made scene. You have a cluster of things here, uh, which uh, uh, which you group together. So it's a kind of a shape texture, you might call it. Um, uh, you also have here these. Here, the, the fact these are trees uh, pretty much comes out. Uh, from the sort of branching structure in the background. Anyway, so yeah, the forking spray of contours. Oh, the wheel. Yeah, that's another clue. Uh, if you look carefully, you see you can see a wheel here. Well, these are all things the computer has to pick out uh, if it's ever going to uh, make sense. OK, so let me go on. Anyway, we've spent enough time. And, and talk a little bit about the math. So the field of computer vision, uh, and in general, the field of ar all artificial intelligence type things, speech, um, uh, robotics, um, uh, there's been a, a, there was a period when there was a huge controversy between those who believed that 
basically logical deduction uh, was involved. Uh, and those who, from the beginning, realized that it was a statistical matter, that in fact, uh, what we really do in our heads is very sophisticated guessing all the time. That's what you're doing in your head. It's called statistical inference. Uh, so what's necessary is to combine um, this tremendous, uh, what, what in statistics is called a prior, uh, a prior probability distribution an experience of looking at the world, of the, what the objects are like, and what you expect to be there. With a particular, I mean, if you go to an art gallery and you see modern art, you, uh, you often have things in front of you which are, are not connected to the world at all, but they evoke in various ways and to various degrees things which are similar to things in the world. And sometimes uh, you respond to this and it's beautiful, and other times maybe you don't like that art. But in any case, you're your knowledge of the world is, is always with you when you open your eyes. Uh, and the big um, uh, clue here was, uh, was the Reverend Bayes' um, uh, rule of the 18th century. So what's Bayes' rule? Uh, so the two events, A and B, uh, and you have P of AB, the probability that both A and B are true facts about, about what's happening. And then you have uh, P of A given B, which means that if you know B is true, what's the probability of A? So you see, the probability of A and B can be factored as the probability of B being true. And if B is true, then the probability that in addition A is true. So, so this is a general rule of conditional probability. And the probability of A and B being both true can be factored in two different ways. And so if you solve this equation, you get this. Now this is relevant uh, in the following situation. Suppose B is something that you, you see, and you want to know uh, how likely it is that A is also true. So let's say B is your data, and A is your interpretation. So you'd like to find the most probable interpretation of that data. That'll be the A which maximizes the probability of A given B. Well, if B is fixed, you can ignore this term here. And this is going to be the same as the maximum of these two. So this is called the prior probability of your interpretation A. So that's your background information. And then there is the impact of this specific, um, the, oh, sorry. The impact of the specific data B is given by uh, to what extent uh, if A is true, it would have caused the data B to be present. So in our case, B would be the perceived image, and A is the interpretation of the image. Uh, and so you're, you're maximizing this by ma because you hope to have a model of this by modeling the nature of the world, which is a gigantic task, but it's one a lot of people envision or undertaking. And, and then this is a so-called imaging model. Uh, if A is a cat, what do, what do images of a cat look like? And so you have, a, you have to develop a model of what all pictures of a cat, what a cat will look like in all possible pictures. Not an easy task. OK, but in any case, this is the beginning. This is the fundamental uh, starting point. So in the case of faces, we saw that lighting was the big obstacle in, in, uh, in interpreting. In fact, it causes two thirds of the variance, if you treat that image as a function, and you treat very, uh, many functions of different faces different in different lighting conditions, you find that two-thirds of the variance of these faces is caused by the variability of the lighting. Uh, and so uh, way back in 87, Kirby and Sorovich uh, said, well, let's just do principal component analysis on a big database of faces. So what does that mean? You take each face, and you, you make it the same number of pixels, and perhaps you crop it to the face. Uh, and you consider this, that set of pixels as a huge vector lying in a vector space. Then uh, what you do is it, you've taken uh, thousands of faces, and they are points in this huge vector space. You, tr you try to look at the, those points as being uh, an ellipsoid. So th there'll be a mean face in the middle of this huge set of data. And then there'll be directions in which uh, these faces vary uh, heavily, and 
and this is called uh, working out the principal components of this database. Okay, so you uh, so you can get a, a so called well a kind of a Gaussian model based on Bayes' rule for images of faces. Well, here's how it works out. Um, this happens to be me actually. Uh, my students used me as a guinea pig. So this was the mean under all illuminations of my face. Then, the, uh, what were the principal directions? Well, they, they, they photographed me with different lighting. And this was a, basically a left versus right lighting. Uh, this was a top-down lighting. This is sort of a second derivative in which I was lit from two sides but not in the front. This is a sort of a diagonal, like a second derivative of cross uh, mixed derivative term. And so on, and to all sorts of small directions, which, are, like here, is reflections on the nose, which are, uh, which are a very prominent feature in many photographs. Okay, so so what we're doing here is, uh, <coughs> you're modeling. So I is the image. This is the intensity of a particular pixel uh, in the image, I of pix, and you're modeling this as being approximately. Uh, the intensity in the mean face plus a sum of lighting corrections uh, with different coefficients. Uh, and these EKs uh, are, the, are the eigenfaces, the principal components. So these are the EKs uh, here for uh, this particular database. Uh, so you see, if, if I had uh, this number of pixels, the image would be a vector of this length, 37. 1,500 uh, length, and if you have a database of 1,000 faces, you have a matrix of this size. So you take the average of the columns and the eigenvectors of, of this, um, those, are, those are so-called principal components. It's not hard to work out on a computer. Uh, and here's an experiment with an, another student of mine, Tai Sing Lee. These were five pictures of him. Here the face is thresholded. Here we've modeled it with this model. Uh, and you see it's quite successful uh, in this sort of illumination. It's not bad here. Here he had a, a, wind, a shadow on his face, and the computer really failed. This, this analysis really failed to understand the nature of that shadow. It wasn't uh, duplicated by principal components. This is a totally non-Gaussian effect. Uh, and here it worked pretty well, too. So these are the, so. This sort of model is very good in reasonable illuminations at, at extracting the face and separating the illumination from the face. Um, but there's much more. Your, he your head can have variable direction. You can have variable expressions. That's really, nowadays, it's a huge industry to work out people's expressions. And then there are characteristics, wrinkles, beards, glasses, hats, tattoos, scars, dirt. Um, you need to infer. I mean, look at this. This is, this is a beautiful book, uh, which is simply has uh, 500 faces in it, each a full-page illustration, nothing else. And it's so obvious that this is a young girl. I think I think that's completely clear. This is an Oriental um, <coughs> face of a, a man in it, maybe his 20s or 30s. This is clearly more like me, <laughs> except it looks kind of Middle Eastern. I think. Um, in any case, you know, you have these ethnic. Uh, Stereotypes that you uh, you superimpose on it, um, but you know this is obviously uh, there's a huge. Um, so let let me pass on. Let's see how am I doing time wise. I have, I have some time. Um, uh, <coughs> so let's. Uh, uh, wait a minute. When did I start? Uh, yeah, I started. Okay, yeah, about forty minutes ago. Um, all right. So the first. Uh, uh, Step often in images is to divide it up uh, into uh, into regions uh, where which are sort of homogeneous in the sense of color and texture. Uh, so this is what the this experiment of, of, of Jitendra's was. Here's another image where he, uh, people segmented it, and then the computer tried to segment it, and it did a decent job. It didn't re the shoreline incidentally the computer had trouble with, but. Uh, so the computer isn't really doing quite as well. And it, o it always got confused with shadows. OK, now there's a beautiful mathematical approach to this, which goes back to physicists, so-called easing models. Um, 
this is a crystal, a two-dimensional crystal of iron atoms that, that uh, have an intrinsic spin, uh, spin up and spin down. Now the point is each atom uh, wants to uh, spin the same way as its neighbors, because that gives it lower energy, but it, it can also be affected by an ambient magnetic field. Uh, and so, I'll go away. Um, my screen is getting cluttered because why is it not disappearing? I'm trying to make this. Maybe it, it, is it? I think it's all right on your end, but on my end I'm getting all right. Maybe it'll go away. Um, anyway, what, this is the energy. Uh, so J is a configuration of the atoms. Uh, for each atom, it's either plus or minus one, up or down. And then the energy says that the J's want to agree for neighbors. Uh, and they also try to align themselves with an external field, which is some real value, uh, which can be positive or negative. So they try to align themselves. All right, that's physics. But here's how, uh, and <clears throat> now the connection with probability, this is the key point. We put the energy into an, the exponent, uh, and this is, and you get a distribution. So T is the temperature, depending on the temperature, you see the higher energies, this will cause this to be smaller and give a lower probability. Lower energies will have higher probability. Um, and this is uh, was how he modeled in statistical mechanics. Uh, right, so at high temperatures, uh, if T is large, the difference between energies is, is going to be small, and essentially all states will be equally likely. But when T gets very small, then this high energies are hugely uh, less probable than low energies. Uh, and the so-called ground state, the minimum of E, becomes the most likely. So here's how it works. So we do this for images. So here's a picture of a cow and a tree <coughs> and the ground. And uh, we try to model this <coughs> by, uh, by making uh, uh, spin up for the atoms correspond to it being a light color and spin down being a dark color. Uh, <coughs> and now uh, we uh, we sample this Gibbs field, that, and this is a high temperature where the up down the atom uh, doesn't much uh, is only weakly affected by the image, and the image appears. Uh, and then we gradually lower the temperature, and it gradually finds the regions uh, in the picture accurately. And this is the so-called ground state. This is the zero temperature. Uh, the minimum of the energy or the maximum of the probability. So from a Bayesian point of view, this is the reconstruction uh, of a division of this picture into foreground background, uh, uh, which has the highest probability. And you see that these ideas from physics uh, did a very good job, in this case, at reconstructing them. Of course, this is a contrived case, which is very simple to solve. Um, now here's a harder one. Um, so this leads to the idea of Markov random fields. The point being that you have uh, you have an image I, and you want to label pixels which have different colors. So you you, you look at regions and with uh, uh, which are going to have a certain uh, a mean color. We disregard texture in this particular uh, version, but but we try to find a hidden variable J that describes the mean energy. So we have a, a model very much like the previous one. Uh, and now you see this is what you would call the prior. In the, if we take e to the minus, the, the exponent of minus the energy, this is going to be the prior. This is the fact that you, you want the regions to, have, to be homogeneous. So nearby pixels should have similar values of j. g, you, can, you fix a g that's going to work for your database. And this is a very interesting learning problem. Uh, this is your imaging model. You say that J is affected by the actual image. Well, here's an instance of it uh, with this um, Chinese uh, girl uh, in a festival uh, with a tiara here, all dressed up, and uh, some fancy stuff in the background. And this is called by physicists uh, a POTS model, a uh, finite number of color, a fixed penalty for pixels being different if they're adjacent. 
uh, and it does a pretty good job. It, it, it divided her hair into two regions because it didn't know about this was um, illuminated more brightly. Uh, it didn't see the symmetry of these things at all. That, that's not built into this model at all. But, but you see, this is a beginning. It's a beginning. And th this is the kind of math. These Markov random fields uh, for a certain group of us have been a very popular model. There are only um, about 10 years ago, uh, the engineering community once, a, once an effective algorithm for minimizing these things was found, all of a sudden the engineering community began to like these models, whereas previously they thought that they were ridiculous. Um, okay, now let me pass on to, uh, to another uh, thing which is central in everything, grammars. Uh, grammars are really uh, huge uh, in, in, in the beliefs of the group that I work with. Um, and what is it? It's the fact that there are certain parts of the image which are meaningful in themselves, uh, which you're going to find again and again in other images. Uh, they're reusable parts. And you have to really find and learn the reusable parts that can be moved intact to other images. And you have to give these uh, give labels uh, for these uh, reusable parts. Uh, but uh, th they're combined, the reusable parts uh, have components, uh, typically, which, which, so we have the horns on the bullock. Uh, we have the, uh, the melons, uh, uh, the, pump, uh, whatever, the coconuts, uh, in this whole cluster of fruit uh, on, on the cart. Uh, so uh, you, you, you see, you, you find these reusable parts typically have components which which uh, combine in, in stereotyped ways which are not exact, uh, but which are which roughly, uh, uh, which, but which nonetheless are reproduced uh, 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 with some consistency. Now, you see, this is exactly what grammar and language is. I mean, in India, you should be very proud of this tremendous genius, Panini, uh, somewhere back around the 5th century BC. Uh, who really invented the idea of grammars. He invented much of computer science, if you really look at it, uh, in analyzing the, the grammar of uh, classical Sanskrit. Uh, but uh, the reusable parts, uh, the label, he was the first to introduce abstract labels to cluster uh, uh, <coughs> things that conjugated in similar ways uh, and uh, production rules by which uh, you produce the, the final sentence. Uh, uh, no, he's very much there. So now on top of all of this, if we're going to do it with Bayes, we need not just a grammar, but a stochastic grammar, one which, which has probabilities. Uh, so we have to ha handle ambiguities in the image. We have to uh, know what impossible images are and be able to reject them. We have to combine syntax with semantics. Uh, so grammars. Uh, grammars in the sense of linguistics are a very specialized, specific kind of grammar. And one of the main activities going on now uh, with several groups has been generalizing grammars in such a way that they are applicable to all aspects of artificial intelligence, uh, to, uh, to motor planning and action planning, uh, to vision, uh, to parsing uh, scenes and videos and understanding uh, what uh, uh, people are, are doing whose, whose actions you don't understand. Uh, of course, in a sinister way, you can imagine uh, uh, in our uh, <coughs> age of terrorism, the, uh, much of this work is being funded uh, by the Defense Department in the US, which is very interested in identifying suspicious looking actions. Uh, automatically uh, by cameras in placed all over the world. Okay. Uh, so now the roots of these of these grammars in vision really go back to these grouping laws of for instance occlusion that we saw. But th there was the Gestalt group of psychologists who did this. And they clustered things in an image based on obviously proximity, that's what we were using before, similar color and texture. These are what we used before in our models. But also good continuation, as in contour completion, parallelism, symmetry, convexity, higher order properties. Uh, 
and some of their most beautiful demos were uh, the fact that uh, this contour here, the teeth behind this amorphous shape, is of course invisible. That was called an amodal contour. And there are beautiful demos, for instance. You see this clearly as a, as a pair standing in front of these ear-like uh, objects. Um, so you do all kinds of things. You complete this contour, and then you complete these contours. You, you're doubly amodal here um, uh, in uh, reconstruction. OK. Uh, but other aspects of grammar, for instance, uh, you can take the dog here. You, the dog is clearly seen as, bro as breaking up into parts. It has the head, the tail, the legs, and then the body itself. Well, one way you do this uh, is by something called the medial axis. This, the body itself uh, has an axis stretched out along here. You take maximum circles inside the body, and uh, they and set for the body, they go from here to here, and they trace out the trunk of the, the animal. Here, the circles go into his head, and they trace out the head. And here, they go down into the limbs and the tail. Uh, so, so this idea of the, the uh, maximum circles, the center of the circles are, are called the medial axis. And uh, where those, where they fork, at these points, you see they uh, 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 they fork, uh, uh, and they 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 move in several directions. Um, here from the body into the tail and the, and the legs. So uh, here's another grammar. Um, uh, this is, I should have, uh, from my former student and now brilliant colleague, Song Chun Zhu at UCLA. So he, he uh, used grammars to analyze clock faces. So typically, a clock face will have the overall uh, shape, it will have hands, and it will have numbers. And the numbers divide up into these into twelve particular numbers, uh, the hands into two, and he he did a stochastic model of this and uh, then uh, tested it on real data. Here's a more complex example of from Zhu's work. This is a kitchen scene. Uh, now the kitchen scene has is full of rectangles, but rectangles seen uh, from perspective, so they've become parallel pipettes. Uh, and uh, so, and it has repetition. It has parallels in it. So, uh, for example, when you when you run so-called edge detectors on the image, you see some of these objects rather easily. So, <coughs> the tiles on the floor; these three were picked out right away, and then it evoked a model up here uh, that uh, of of, uh, <coughs> of repetition. And that model then found weak signals from adjacent tiles and began to cluster the whole of the floor. Uh, likewise, the tabletop was identified right away. Uh, and that evoked a model of a three-dimensional parallel pipette seen prospectively, uh, and so on. So, uh, so here was uh, an object with a frame. So he had essentially all the um, uh, uh, the basic elements of perspective geometry uh, built into the grammar and and this kitchen scene, which of course was ideal for that sort of reconstruction, uh, was then parsed uh, bit by bit by applying these grammar rules uh, to which would produce things like tiled floors, tables, and frames. Um, so he had a whole series of rules for this. So um, so this is is going nicely. Now, uh, unfortunately, the world is huge. And uh, to go further uh, is, is going to uh, require a, um, uh, many more things. Now, one of the problems is uh, sort of rubbery models, deformations. This is a caricature. Uh, I, uh, I, one of my students uh, was. Uh, working on what's a very popular collection of algorithms, warping of one face onto another uh, by uh, deforming uh, <coughs> the, uh, the image uh, by what we would call mathematically a diffeomorphism, so it's a smooth mapping. So here, what's happened is you start with a, this uh, 
Buckles graduate student and the harp seal, and you seek to deform this image um, to this image, or and vice versa. So if so, you you try to find uh, a one-to-one -one mapping uh, between these two images, uh, and then you carry along this image by the one-to-one -one mapping, so as to match it with this image, and you get this, and you carry the harp seal along to match with the human, and you get this. So clearly. The big problem is this huge eyes and the fact that the nose is confused uh, here. Unfortunately, the human nose is not black, like the harp seal's nose. Uh, but this is not just, and this is obviously a joke, <coughs> but this is a, now a huge <coughs> technology in medical imaging in which uh, you take a scan of a human body of one kind or another and you try to uh, match it up with a, uh, <coughs> a stereotype uh, a prototype human and uh, and identify that way all the organs present uh, uh, in that particular human and then by having that matching you find the things that uh, uh, that aren't matching very well the derivative is very high and you assume something is is different uh, maybe there's some <coughs> medical condition there so you need to model uh, the myriads of <laughs> categories of stuff in the world gigantic <coughs> task. Um, and unfortunately, the raw, these raw statistical approaches have been very popular, but they've kind of reached a dead end, and, and I think it's clearly that to go further, grammars are needed. Very object specific warping models uh, are, are going to be needed. Uh, and this uh, may take a while to go through everything in the world. People are working hard, for instance, on expressions and uh, uh, analyzing different types of faces. This is. Uh, Obviously, um, face identification uh, is is a is a huge uh, enterprise. Okay, so let me wrap up the talk uh, with a uh, few conclusions here. Um, what what I think is exciting about this field in general is that uh, you have uh, v various ideas coming from a huge quantity of fields. You see, you've seen how ideas ideas from physics have been used very effectively. Uh, and I, I haven't even mentioned some of the rather marvelous ideas that were lying in the physics literature that then people stumble on and realize, oh my god, this is really going to help us with image parsing. Um, obviously, statistics everywhere, and as a, they've statisticians drawn in. Um, mathematicians uh, have been playing the role of uh, trying to synthesize uh, and, and seeing the overall ideas. The, the I find engineers, by and large, are very oriented always to very concrete, immediate applications, um, whereas the mathematicians may look for the more general uh, thing that's going on. But in any case, all these fields have been working together, um, and uh, obviously the the fastest machines have been drawn in. I mean, the, the problem is that the brain is is intensely parallel, and computers are not. Uh, and parallel processing uh, seems to be uh, <coughs> essential to address the fact that there are so many uh, millions of different types of objects in the world, and you, when you're confronted with a new scene, you, you have no idea where to start. And it would seem sort of obvious that parallel computing is, is essential to really solve. Um, and I think uh, <coughs> we've, uh, myself, in working in this area. Of seen different cycles in which experimentation has has reached a dead end and then but then the problems have been analyzed the theory has been deepened algorithms new algorithms have been proposed more experimentation is carried out uh, and this sort of cycle between the theory and the experiment uh, is, to me is is what makes this this field unique and it's uh, um, I think it's very essential to to be able to uh, look at the theory and look at the uh, be able to carry out experiments to make progress. Um, I myself am a, simply a MATLAB. I'm stuck on MATLAB because I don't like uh, more difficult programming. But um, um, <coughs> yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, I hope I hope this will encourage some of you. I, this is this sort of work is going on. Uh, I'd say really the three completely different career paths. Um, it 
it's going on in very serious ways academically, um, in, especially in, in some universities, it's obviously Stanford, MIT, um, Caltech, uh, <coughs> CMU in, in the US, um, um, in the IITs uh, here in, uh, <coughs> where you are in India. Uh, it's also in some large labs, uh, this uh, Microsoft uh, has several very large labs uh, uh, working on these, uh, but of course I've found that uh, many of my students were seduced by startups. Uh, startups can eat you alive uh, <laughs> because the cycle of uh, getting something out uh, uh, is so short and uh, uh, personally uh, I found that people minimize the uh, getting into the field often to minimize the advantages of academia where uh, you have a much longer time horizon and you can work on something uh, for um, five years without um, uh, your investors <laughs> without going broke <laughs> or the lab cutting your funding. Uh, okay, so enough of that. So uh, good luck uh, and thank you. Uh, So we have time for questions if you want. I don't know whether you you're all probably very hungry, I think. <laughs> so can you can you take questions? I, c I could I'm happy to take a few questions, sure. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, one problem in learning the statistical models of objects is uh, is the is the learning problem where uh, uh, Th things can be supervised or unsupervised. So, for example, your work on the stochastic grammar describes how parts can be learned automatically, how, how you learn those things automatically. But uh, h how does that fall in a general framework? As in, uh, humans also have a different kind of learning. Uh, so, h how does the learning that we employ in algorithms correlate with algorithms that are uh, that, that, that we that, that happens naturally in the brain. Yeah, no, I, I mean I haven't touched on, on the learning problem. The learning problem is of course absolutely essential and and it's, it's huge and especially uh, you know when you begin to try to create these grammars uh, you uh, uh, it's easy enough if you have some toy models and you can uh, uh, try to almost by hand create the appropriate grammars, as I think uh, Zhu did with that kitchen scene. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> but when it comes to the reality of the world, uh, there are just so many uh, thousands of, of different uh, uh, categories of objects. So uh, so the learning problem has, is 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 really central, and I, I haven't touched on that, uh, but. It's um, uh, it's it's very very actively uh, being pursued, and it's uh, so. I mean, there's, there's sort of two sides to it. There, uh, vision has certain uh, rules which are which are very general and, and universal. Uh, we have uh, occlusion is is and lighting uh, are. Um, and rotation, seeing things from different angles, are sort of universal obstacles to identifying objects. Uh, but then you have, um, I mean, literally, uh, people have estimated something like 10,000 different categories of objects uh, for which models uh, have to be learned. Uh, and uh, this is an uh, extremely active area now. And I think. Uh, so people are working their work. There was the so-called Caltech 100, where at Caltech they they picked a hundred categories of objects, and and attempted to see how far people could go in learning uh, models for each of these hundred objects. But a hundred objects just uh, it's really just the beginning. There's many more than that in the world. Uh, so you you have to have object-specific things, 
and then you and you have to combine them with the, the general obstacles of light of illumination variability, uh, the orientation, and so yeah, it, this is um, uh, this, it's a huge enterprise right now, and, and I have to say that the grammar approach is at this point not universally adopted. This is specific to uh, uh, to several groups, particularly. Uh, uh, UCLA group with, with Zhu, the Brown group uh, with Giemann, uh, the uh, Berkeley group with Malik, um, uh, then this uh, uh, Perona at Caltech. Uh, certain people very much realize that, that grammars are necessary, but uh, so it, the field, but it's becoming. Uh, I think the field is exploding now. With uh, there's enough computer power to seriously address it. Hello, sir. My uh, question is in regards to uh, uh, computation of eigenfaces. In one of the slides, uh, eigenfaces are shown, and uh, principal component analysis is used in computing uh, eigenfaces. So, right. so yeah. So I am saying that uh, principal component analysis is signal dependent tool. So what about using signal independent uh, transform? Because uh, we need not uh, know the class uh, from which the image object uh, is coming. Yeah, so I'm not quite sure what algorithm you're referring to. So you want, instead of going beyond principal component analysis, you want to use a more sophisticated clustering? Uh, or what, what was the algorithm you mentioned? Uh, uh, no, sir. Like principal component analysis is a signal dependent tool, as I know. So, yes. So I'm saying that uh, what about using any signal independent tool uh, like DCT, DFT? So can uh, can oh. we have a good performance? Yeah. Well, people did. Uh, DCT is can be can be useful to get a sort of a gross uh, picture idea of what's happening, but it's. Uh, I don't know. It, it, it hasn't proved to be particularly useful. Uh, I mean, people people have worked hard to. Uh, I mean, the the simpler tools don't seem to be too effective. You you need, you need to. Uh, I mean, so there's this contour completion problem. Um, so uh, you 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 have a contour and it's partially occluded and and you. And, and you want to uh, uh, to join the two sides, so so there's a whole uh, set of different algorithms which people propose to try to do that. Okay, and sir, uh, which mechanism is used for thresholding for uh, illumination separation? Like it was, there was a slide where uh, uh, illumination to separate illumination, some thresholding is used. I want to know which mechanism of thresholding. Was okay, used. so. Uh, so this is a trick. If you have a color image, uh, the the trick is that often the illumination simply uh, decreases, makes everything darker and lighter, but the colors remain the same. Uh, this isn't entirely true because uh, the shadows don't have quite the same. Uh, it can be illuminated by a, a different collection of colors than than the the things in bright light. But but there is a there's a tendency for the, the so you, you can try to use the color signal and, and discount the, um, the black and white signal. Uh, but you also have to, um, uh, I think you have, to, one of the first problems in parsing the scene is, is to find the overall illumination which is present in that scene. So if you can identify the light sources in a scene, uh, this can be very helpful. And then, so, so I think that this has to be a recursion going on. Um, I think what happens in the head uh, is very similar to what machines are going to have to do, where there is a, a sort of a bottom-up process in which certain things are identified fairly quickly, uh, and then this leads you to certain overall hypotheses, which allow you to uh, to pick out what's the the really significant parts. So there's a there's a top-down, bottom-up feedback loop going on. Uh, and in that feedback loop, identifying the illumination 
is, I think, one of the uh, keys, uh, very early steps that uh, tends to be carried out. I mean, I think this is this neurophysiological evidence that this is taking place also, so that um, you discount shadows uh, in something like 100 milliseconds. You get feedback as uh, loop enables you to helps you do that. Yeah, thank you. I mean, people have uh, they, they've looked at their with various brain scans. You can uh, you can actually trace uh, the uh, uh, the uh, activity of, of a cluster of neurons at, at different phases uh, after the initial uh, uh, saccade to a certain part of the image. Mm 